please welcome writer, director, Matthew B Brown. Welcome, welcome, Matthew. Um, Thanks. Um, I, when I introduced everyone for coming. I, when I introduced the film, I mentioned that this was based on a play, but you managed to make it uh, very cinematic. Can you tell us about that challenge of making it? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, th yeah. Thank you so much for coming and, and watching the film. Um, I uh, very grateful. It's, it's really wonderful to share it with you. Um, that was the big challenge with the film, was trying to find a path to, to breaking it out of two men in a room, basically, for the whole film. And I, I did another film called The Man in New Infinity a few years ago, and um, it's had some similar challenges, because um, it was also, um, it, was, it took place in uh, university, and it was in rooms a lot. Um, so with this film, I wanted to try a few things cinematically with it. Um, but it's a challenge because you you want to stay engaged with the with the conversation, and yet at the same time, if you just have the conversation in the room, it 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 starts to lose its um, mm -hmm. its uh, I don't know engagement, I guess. So um, I I wanted it to feel um, that it wasn't just flashbacks to their life necessarily, but it also could have a bit of a dreamlike quality, and also have um, a sense of the subconscious, which I thought played into. Um, certainly Freud's work, so, yeah. Cool. yeah. We had the C.S. Lewis, the gothic quality, yeah. and then with Freud, it was the, the dream subconscious. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, we briefly talked outside about, about the movement in the film. Um, and, and you know, how Freud seems to kind of have this manic energy about him. Yeah. Yeah, um, it was something that um, I talked about a lot in advance with Hopkins was, um, I guess what drew me to the film, um, aside from how I felt, how timely it was in some ways, um, was also uh, looking at mortality and um, looking at death and that this is a person who's days away from dying. And um, I sort of likened it to, I had a dog that was 14 years old and was passing and I, took it to the vet and, and she got up off the table and gave me a big lick in the face and I thought, oh, I'm gonna go home with her. But I was like, no, I'm not gonna sadly get to go home with her. And for Freud, this is his kind of moment mm -hmm. um, where he's looking back over the course of this day and he's got this final burst of sort of manic energy, as you put it, and he's, um, you know, he lays back and he'll bounce back up. Spring right up. He knows it's the end. And I think in some ways that's what also really intrigued me. It's like. We're all so certain of our ideologies and our basic philosophies until we're not when you're a couple days away from dying and you want to hear another side of the conversation and maybe look and take, mm -hmm. take another look because maybe there is something to it. I mean, to me, my father's a psychiatrist and um, I, so I was a little reticent about doing the film to begin with, but he, he what he told me about Freud, which I really liked, was that um, he was somebody that constantly challenged his own ideas, and if he was alive today, he would have probably said all of his ideas were ridiculous and gone on to new ideas. Um, so it's, um, I, I think there's something great in intellectual curiosity and being able to listen, and um, even if you don't agree with somebody, try, try out just listening and hearing other ideas, and, and that's something with this film that a lot of people I think felt like I needed to choose a side or you know go one way or the other way, and I wanted to make a film where it's okay to disagree and it's okay to hear other ideas. Um, it doesn't it doesn't um, it doesn't hurt you to do that. Maybe even opens you up to being able to take a look at who you are in a different way. Correct. Um, yeah. um, speaking of curiosity, the production design in his office and Freud's office, there is so much art and artifacts, his desk. There's so much to look at. Um, can you tell us about the genesis of that? Yeah, well, it, it's really based on Freud's actual office. So I had a fabulous um, production designer that I'd worked with before named Luciana Arrighi. Um, and she'd actually worked with Hopkins 50, no, 30 years ago. I don't know how long ago. It was on Howard's End, I think, and Remains of the Day. She did both of those films. Um, so she worked really closely with the museum in London, 
um, where they did uh, 3D replications of all the different statuettes. And um, so she really, she, she made it a character unto itself. And I think also, like, I mean, it, you, you get the sense from Freud that he is somebody who is curious about other, other ideologies and mythologies. And there's a lot of commonality between Lewis and Freud in many ways, their, their love of mythology and, and story. So. Um, and then Hopkins, when he speaks or mentions something, there's always this laughter that follows. Um, is that something that you wrote into the script, or it, no? Something we just kind of it kind of evolved. We you know through rehearsal and through um, just I think the approach to Freud was that he felt like he he could laugh at himself and at the absurdity of everything, and that you know I think there was a similarity between Hopkins' own philosophy on life to a degree and the character at times. And, and one of the things that I think probably stood out the most was this idea that the great sin, uh, I think, I'm probably speaking for Tony here, but like is this idea of moral certainty, moral certainty uh, where we, we just can't open up to anything else. And I think mm -hmm. he saw it in himself, in his own works, um, and also in, in other lines of work like Lewis's ideas about God. So I think he laughed at himself as much as anything. I think that's what part of it was and the absurdity of life and the fact that he's gonna die and that frankly nobody knows because none of us have come back from the dead unless it's Lazarus and then you'd have to believe Lewis, I guess so. <laughs> um, Matthew Good is so terrific in this and um, we've been talking about listening and he had such a I was just fascinated watching him that he is so attentively listening, but you also sort of well, feel yeah. his process. He's remarkable. I mean, Matthew, I, I think, and I, I'm not an actor, but I'm sure there's actors in the room, but I, I think one of the hardest things in acting is actually being present and listening. And it's something that we talked about for his character. It was really important to be present, to take the blows, to listen, and to, um, just sort of go into almost a zen-like state at times. And what's so great about Matthew is not everybody is able to express themselves in listening by being so present. And, and it comes across, there's like a whole dialogue going on between Freud and him even when it's not going on. It's even when it is more one-sided, which it is a lot in the film. So. And he incorporates the PTSD in his performance yeah. as well. Can you talk about it? Yeah, I mean, I think both characters had their their thing, um, and for for Lewis, it was PTSD. Um, so, it, you know, I think Lewis replaces his mother in a way with with Janie Moore, um, which was a result of the PTSD of his dying her mother his mother dying when he was so young and being shipped off to boarding school, which he equated as being worse than actually the trenches. And then he had what happened in the trenches as well. So it, it's sort of omnipresent in Lewis's character. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Matthew did a wonderful job of, of um, internalizing that. In, in, in the script and the, the arc of the story, there is this whole intellectual discussion. But then there's also balance with an emotional uh, discussion uh, aspect to it. Can you tell us about balancing those two? Well, yeah, I think it's a, I mean, I, I always saw it as um, a therapy session between the two men in a way. I mean, they're both looking at their issues. You have the PTSD with Lewis, you have the issue with Freud dying and having an unresolved relationship with his daughter and all the pain of losing the other daughter. So I think this day, over the course of this day, they're looking at both of the, both of their own human, human um, foibles and, and uh, problems in their lives. And at the same time, you have the arc of the conversation that goes on, which is this question of God. Um, and I think it, it will certainly talks to Freud, who's about to pass. So um, probably a little less relevant, but not so much so, because Lewis really just did find, you know, he just became a Christian at that point. Um, so, and I think during World War II, that's really when Lewis came to fame, um, giving these talks during the war about Christianity. So. Mm -hmm. Um, there is more than one therapy session. We also have the daughter yeah. uh, aspect. Tell us about the importance of inclu including, that's something you brought in, and the inclusion, the storyline of yeah. the daughter. Well, it, it is, and I'm, I'm sure it could be a movie unto itself, but it, it was, it, it's really, to me, it was important to understand Freud. You can't really understand Freud at this time unless you understand the, the difficult relationship he had with, 
with Anna. Um, I also had a wonderful actress in Liv Lisa Fries to play that role. I mean, she's amazing. Um, so um, it was trying to, trying to get into that attachment disorder and show it some so that um, we could feel it and understand it in the end. I mean, I, I hope it lands. I mean, one of the most important things about showing Freud in, with his daughter in this is that he he's basically has his daughter's lover in therapy and he has his own daughter in therapy, which by today's standards, I think sends you to jail. I don't know. <laughs> so um, it's, it's pretty complex stuff. So it felt really, really important to me to show that relationship. I mean, the same could be said with the PTSD with Lewis. I think without seeing the PTSD in the church or seeing the war, you're just being told this is a man who has PTSD in a room with two men talking, you know? And sure, we can go with that, but this is cinema. And to me, I'd rather take... Um, be more ambitious and take the challenge to actually show that and try to find a way to make that um, a part of these characters, characterizations. And when, when, when you were plotting the film, th th there's a symmetry in, in the fact that we have Anna and Freud and then we have Jamie, Jamie Moore and, um, yeah. and C.S. Lewis. Is that something that you, you wanted, that, that balance? I did want that and it um, was a balancing act. Um, this film, this film was um, shot last April, so we just, we just finished the film. Um, really, um, we rushed really fast for AFI, and um, I mean, I was cutting the day, I mean, we were mixing the day before AFI with a temp mix, um, and then I got a little bit of time um, after AFI for a couple weeks to just sit with my editor and, and make some more changes. Um, and we took out probably 12 minutes of the film and a lot of what we took out revolved around Janie Moore actually and Lewis. And cause there came a point where I was realizing you had to make a decision about which way you wanted to go with the film. Um, and and, and I, I went more with Anna Freud because I thought that was such a big reveal for Freud in the end when he says that he was his, his daughter's therapist. and. Um, I didn't want that to feel totally out of the blue, but it was a real balancing act between Lewis and Janie Moore and Freud and Anna, so, yeah. Um, and then World War II is, brings an urgency to the yeah. story. You know, tell us about... Uh, well, that, that's interesting, because I mean, that's one of the things that drew me to the film originally. I mean, I started this project about six years ago, and like I said, I was a little hesitant, um, but Six years ago, I, th I thought to myself, my God, everything's so polarized. You turn on, everybody's in, they watch one channel or they watch the other channel, <laughs> and nothing goes in between. And it was making me crazy. And um, cut to six years later, and it's that on steroids. It's like, we've all gone mad. There's no listening anymore. There's no in between. There's no, there is no room for the middle. Um, so... Um, what was your question again? <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was about the urgency of war. The urgency of the war. So yeah, so the, it does. It plays a huge role in it because today, today I feel like we are. I mean, it has gotten so bad that it feels like the beginning of a war. We have two wars going on right now. Total intolerance. Total. Yeah, the looming yeah. tyranny and dictatorship. I mean, it's unbelievable. And and we have elections coming up. That I. How many people can raise their hand and say they feel confident that it's going to be a smooth election? I mean, mm -hmm. it's like, I just, I just feel like there's so many parallels. And if you don't learn from history, and you don't listen, and you don't want to listen, you're going to be doomed to repeat it. So, yeah. um, I felt like there was some urgency in making a film like this right now, where we actually don't have to take a side, and you can have respect and tolerance. And, and, um. and you made the choice of, we hear Hitler, yeah. and, and we, you subtitle. Yeah, that was really important to me. I, I felt like, growing up, I'd, I was probably like one of those people that read the airplane novel, like loved the Ken Follett books, and you know, just for, for fun, spy, spy movies and the whole bit. But anytime you ever heard Hitler, it's just, you know, barking sounds, basically. It's just like, madness and you don't actually listen to the, what the actual words are because it's all in German. So what, it felt really important to me just in the beginning to put the subtitles on to actually hear that the words that that man said to an entire country, yeah. you know, in the world, frankly. So you, words are important. You have to listen to what people tell you they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's why I did that. Yeah. There was one moment that I, 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 I was very emotional watching it. It's so touching. Um, it's it's uh, Freud when he goes to the church and he stops to look at the 
the, the windows. You know, can you tell us about that moment? I mean, that's in Mark's script, and it was great. And it just, it's one of those moments that um, I just, I really, uh, I loved it. It just shows that this is a man that can appreciate, you know, different cultures, different ideas. Um, doesn't mean he agrees with them. Um, mm -hmm. and, yeah, but also uh, in the middle of this, you yeah. know, air raid, know. and then he stops to look at art. It's, yeah, and you know, Lewis has just come out of this really traumatic moment. I mean, that's sort of the beginning of their friendship in the movie, mm -hmm. I think, in a way. It's like, they, you know, Lewis kind of smiles at him when he talks to the priest there and he leaves. And um, it's, there's a lot of subtlety in the film, and I hope it, I hope it lands. But it, um, it, it's really a film about just human kindness and friendship at the end of the day. I mean, I feel like at the end of it, that these two men who couldn't disagree more with one another, I feel like they don't want to leave the room at the end and they yeah. actually like each other, mm -hmm. which is kind of nice, so. No, he, you, in the footnote that we get that he, um, Freud did meet uh, with a scholar, but it. He it, did, yeah, he did. Actually, um, Jill Freud, Lady Jill Freud, was um, taken in by Lewis uh, as a child, um, I was a refugee and came to live with Lewis and became the source of inspiration for Lucy in the Narnia books. Um, oh. And I actually only learned that after making the film, uh, mm. funny enough. But there was a connection, I think. And um, the original author of the book, uh, Question of God, um, Armin, he, he had done a bunch of research. Um, and I think he had this, this whole... This whole movie, the play, it all came out of a course up at Harvard that went on for about 36 years that was looking at atheism through the eyes of Freud, and then they eventually brought in C.S. Lewis as a counterpoint, and when he did that, the course just took off, and um, huge enrollment, and um, went on for 30 years, and then, um, so, um, it, it was, uh, I don't know, it's a, uh, I've lost my track there, too. <laughs> no, it's all right, we're, yeah. Um, I, I'm, before I forget, I want to ask you about the score. In particular, the piano motif when Anna shows up to to Freud's house at the end. Oh, that's that's Hopkins. That's he Hopkins. wrote the yeah, score. Yeah, he wrote that part of the score. It was amazing. Um, we were we were shooting that scene, and I wasn't sure which way I wanted to end the film, and it was holding that shot for a really long time between Anna and Dorothy and um, Jody Balfour, who played Dorothy, is also fantastic. Um, she said, could we have a little playback and there's some music because we're holding this so long. I was like, yeah, that's an interesting idea. I had no idea what to do. I'm like flipping on my phone trying to find some music and Hopkins came up to me and said, well, what about this? And he pulls up the YouTube and it's like a, a waltz and I'm like, okay, all right. When it, so we played it and I realized that it was actually, Tony was in the audience on the YouTube video and I was like, this is strange and then he wrote it. So, wow. um, so when we were in the edit, I, my editor put um, the waltz in, never expecting to use it. Um, and it just, to me, it really worked. And, it, and it, the weird thing was like the changes in the waltz happened with picture. I didn't have to edit that. So, um, so I called up Hopkins and he agreed to, to give it to us. So yeah. And, was, you know, and tell us about working with Hopkins. He, lovely, absolutely lovely, uh, creatively generous. Um, you know, it was challenging. I mean, he's 80. <laughs> turning 86 a week ago. So, you know, we're doing upwards of seven pages a day. It's, uh, that, that's tricky. So um, he was amazing and he, uh, he was really brave about it. He didn't use an earpiece or any cue cards or anything and Matthew was incredible. And we really cleared the space, got crew to stand back, nobody around the monitors. And um, it just became our, our little safe space for three weeks and it, it was pretty great. I mean, this was a pretty independent film, and we shot it in 30 days, so it was, it was fast. Amazing. Um, and last question, how, how does your, your dad's reaction to the film? He loved it. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean he's, he's not exactly partial, but he, he loved it. But he showed it to some of his psychiatrist friends, and I was pretty scared about that. And they, <laughs> they all liked it, too. In fact, it, it's been really embraced by the psychiatric community and by the, um, the religious community. And I think they both felt like we were true to them, uh, true to those people and their values in the sense that um, I had the same thing on Infinity where it was really important that the mathematicians felt like I was authentic with that and I learned from that and I tried to do the same here. So um, 
Yeah. I mean, um, I want to go back real quickly to you. By passing, you mentioned that you didn't want to take sides. Yeah. Um, you know, can you expand on that? Well, I mean, the play doesn't take a side, so there's that. Um, but I never wanted to in the sense that I don't feel like it was my place as a film. I mean, it's certainly my place as a filmmaker that if I have a side I want to take, to take a side. But in this film, with what I was trying to do, which was let audiences leave and have a conversation if they wanted to about whether they liked the film or if they didn't like the film, but to maybe talk about some things that, you know, we're scared to talk about uh, around Thanksgiving tables or holiday tables or anything. You, it, people are scared to talk. And I just thought, I want to make something that allows people to have a conversation out of it and have and feel like they can, and they can do it with, um, with respect, respectfully having a conversation. Even if you disagree, even if it gets heated, it's okay, you know? And if I took a side, I think it, I think today I feel like everyone's kind of got an agenda with the politics and film. And I'm not saying that that's not okay. It's fine if you have something and you're really passionate about it. Um, it's also fine not to if there's something that you feel like, um, for me to insert my politics into this, I think, I'm inserting my politics in the way of saying, hey, people, wake up, let's listen, and I'll stay out of it on this one. Maybe not on the next one, but <laughs> you know, if there is one, but this isn't going to be the place where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. So. Well, job well done, and thank you so much for, for being here, thank Matthew. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, everybody.